What is up, everybody? Mr. Purtis here. Welcome to 8.7. We're doing a little decolonization in Sub-Saharan Africa. We did India. We did Vietnam. We'll do a little on the Middle East as well next. But let's rock and roll in Sub-Saharan Africa first. If you don't know where Sub-Saharan Africa is, it is everything south of the Sahara Desert in Africa. So the Sahara is right here and it's everything to the south. A little contextualization, just in case you forgot or in case you don't remember, um, during imperialism, all of Africa was colonized by European countries um, in what is generally referred to as the Scramble for Africa, which took place right around 1884, so about 30 years prior to World War I starting. Um, and World War I, I mean, I don't even know why I gotta say this, you guys know this already. During World War I, colonies in Africa were promised independence if they helped fight for the European powers, and they do, and they send volunteers, and then they're not given their independence. And then after World War II, or during World War II, they ask for, they're asked to fight again, and they do, and then after World War II, they're like, yo, where's our independence? And over the course of this, nationalism is increasing. In, in, in Africa, there's really going to be two phases of decolonization. There's the 40s and 50s. There's basically like late 40s, 50s into the early 60s. That's usually a peaceful transfer of power. And most of this happened in West Africa and North Africa. So for the most part, we're talking peaceful, nonviolent, negotiating independence. In the 60s and 70s, which is mainly going to be in the southern part of Africa, they are not going to get their independence when the rest of Africa does in the 40s and 50s and early 60s. So they are like kind of left saying what's going on here and there's going to be more of a fight or um, active resistance against European rule. Um, also, I just want to point out kind of one like I don't know if it's a fun fact. This is not a fun fact. This is a horrible fact. Um, these borders that you see here are the borders that were created by Europeans during the scramble for Africa during colonization and imperialism. Those borders are the same borders that, pretty much the same borders that exist today. When the Europeans created these borders, they didn't care the different ethnic groups that they put in one country together, and they controlled those people so harshly that there was very little rebellion by ethnic groups against each other. However, when, they gained, when many of these countries gained their independence, now you have a whole bunch of different ethnic groups who don't like each other, in one country together, which is going to lead to a lot of problems in Sub-Saharan Africa to this day, where we have a lot of violence and warfare that goes on between competing groups who want to control government power. So I just want to mention that. Um, one, I, I want to give you kind of two examples here in this. First one is in India. This is Gamal Abdel Nasser. He is the president of Egypt in the 1950s after they gained their independence. He decides that this Suez Canal that was built by the British in the 1800s to help shorten trade routes between India and Britain, which was located right here if you forgot, um, he decides that he's going to nationalize it, meaning that, again, this term nationalizing, I can't say this enough, is very socialist or communist. The government is going to take control of the Suez Canal, and instead of it being run by private companies or by another government, they are going to take control as the government and take the profits and then distribute those profits essentially to uh, the people of Egypt. Like I said in the, in the last video, if you forgot, or in India, this is a very common solution to raise revenue and to help increase um, industrialization in countries. So that's Nasser. You can see by the clothing he's wearing, he's wearing a suit and tie, shows you that he is uh, westernized in a sense, and he is um, has probably a solid connection or at least um, educated in the West, which is which is true. So I want to do focus really for the rest of this on case study in South Africa. If you remember a little contextualization specifically in South Africa, there's a lot of resources in South Africa. The Dutch had been there since the age of exploration. During imperialism, the British come in. Um, so there's the, some Dutch people there. There's some there's British people there. And it's really the center point for exploration. So it's like the midway point if you're going all the way around Africa between Britain and India. And like I said, during imperialism, the British are going to conquer it from the Dutch, and they make it a settler colony. So Britain, British people start going and moving there. Um, this, at first, they have it separated into different states. We have the area for the Zoshas, the Zulus. We have the, the area for the Dutch, which is the Orange Free State, and then the rest for the British. And then in 1910, the British kind of make it entirely part of our empire. An important thing that happens here is after World War II, as many countries in Africa are gaining their independence and fighting for independence, South Africa actually is going to tighten their control. 
The British government leaves, but they leave all the white folks in charge. And the white people are only like 10% of the population. So while everyone's getting their independence and equality and freedom, whatever, in Africa, this a new system emerges in South Africa called the apartheid system. And the apartheid system is a harsh, strict segregation system between whites and blacks. So again, to put this in the U.S. context, if you, if you know U.S. history, this is around the time that the civil rights movement is going on in the United States. And this apartheid system, the root of the word here is apart, um, this separation is going to happen. Apartheid has many different characteristics of it. The most common and the, the most easiest for us to, to, for you probably to understand is one is educational differences. White kids had really good schools. Black kids had not enough desks and not enough books and, and overcrowded classes. Marriage was banned between whites and blacks. It was illegal. It was illegal to be engaged in any sexual activity um, with someone of the, a different race. You Voting was restricted only to white people. Um, so anyone who was non-white couldn't vote. Living spaces were different. The white people generally lived in very plush, lush, nice areas. Um, black people tend to live in little areas that had very limited resources, kind of in like desert type areas. And then lastly, and kind of the most significant to people in South Africa were the pass laws. If you were black and you tried to leave your, your township, your neighborhood, you needed a, a pass to leave and go into other areas. So anywhere you traveled, you needed a government kind of stamp to say that it was okay if you go. As a result of this, we're going to see a nationalist movement. This is, if you're not getting the theme of this, this is everywhere. We have these nationalist leaders kind of rise up. And in South Africa, the, the main nationalist group is called the African National Congress or the ANC. Their goal is to end apartheid and to create equality for whites and black people in South Africa. In the 1950s, when this movement starts, it's nonviolent. But by the 60s, like other areas in sub-Saharan Africa, as they don't get equality, it turns violent. And violent generally by bombing government buildings, bombing trains that are bringing resources, and sometimes people get killed in that process. Um, and that was the mentality. The leader of this is Nelson Mandela. He is Western educated. Look at the shirt and tie here. Western educated. Here he's in his kind of traditional um, um, South African garb and, or clothing. Um, and he is going to be arrested in 1962. He is sentenced to life in prison on a place below the tip of South Africa. It's a little island called Robben Island. And he is sent there with 1,500 other ANC members to spend their life in prison, essentially breaking rocks and a harsh, harsh conditions there. In 1989, as Cold War is ending and as um, increased communication happens and as pressure is on the South African government, as people have, boy have boycotted South Africa for this harsh condition. 1989, like that's like your parents were alive and conscious back then for the most part. Um, and in 1989, Mandela is going to be freed from prison, which is a huge deal. He becomes like the symbol of apartheid. The f there's a free Mandela movement around the world in the 80s. And as a result, apartheid is going to end in 1992. The white South African apartheid government realized that it just wasn't sustainable anymore with cultural changes around the world and an anti-apartheid national movement. And in 1994, South Africa has their first free election, meaning that everyone was allowed to vote. And Mandela was elected president. So Mandela served two terms in office. To, there was a lot of really horrible things that happened under apartheid, not only just the day-to-day -day, like discrimination, but also um, trying to find ANC members. People were tortured, people were killed. The government did some horribly awful things. And the new government run by Mandela says, we're not going to arrest and throw everyone in jail. We're going to have a truth and reconciliation commission. If you work for the apartheid government and if you did something horrible, you must speak the truth and say what you did and ask for forgiveness. So truth and reconciliation. So admit your crimes for apartheid and you will serve no jail time. And this system essentially works. Um, so as a result, the people who are part of this apartheid government are allowed to continue with their lives. Now, here's the issue in South Africa today. We had this apartheid system and this discrimination for a hundred years, significant hundred years. Now everyone can vote equally, but the white people still own all the, all the, the good land and have the, have the money and the resources. So there's still a large amount of unequal distribution of wealth based on racial lines. There's also a lot of racial tensions in South Africa today. Um, so there's, there's still a lot of these issues that exist, you know, 20 years after the end of the apartheid system. So that's South Africa. That's apartheid. You know the deal. I'm out.